So that's Rio. He's almost six, and that is Soledad. And she comes from a long line of breeding to be able to deal with bears, but for us, it's to deal with bears to reduce problems, to conserve bears. So. All right. I've got my Wind River Bear Institute stuff and my wildlife system. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think I'm all set. Well, thanks for coming, everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Carrie Hunt here. She's the founder and director of the Wind River Bear Institute, and uh, I would say the person who's done more to improve uh, relationships between wildlife and humans than anyone in the world. So, welcome. <laughs> There's nowhere to go but downhill. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so, hello. We usually get introduced after the dogs are introduced because that is our signature. The dogs are our signature. Uh, we're the only ones in the world using dogs to try to teach bears and uh, our dogs can not only find bears bear sign but they can push bear sign or push bears so what i'd like to do today is um have a nice informal talk ask questions don't be afraid to uh interrupt because what i'm here what we are here to do is inspire you to go after what you think would be meaningful work that's, that you hold in your hearts. And it's really important for you to hear our story over the past 22 years and what we've gotten done. So I'm Carrie Hunt. I'm director of the Wind River Bear Institute. This is Nils Pedersen. He's a grad student here. Most of you have met him, I'm sure. Uh, and these are our wildlife service dogs, Soledad and Rio. And I thank the Wildlife Society, Elise, uh, for inviting us. And I thank you guys for coming here. Scott, I've known Scott since we were in grad school together. And it's just a pleasure to be back up here. So you guys are kind of a part of history for our institute. 22 years ago, I came up here to the International Bear Association Conference and told the world's gathered bear biologists that I was tired of watching bears die in the same places for the same things and that I knew relocation hardly ever worked and I was sick of putting bears down. I'd been a bear biologist for 22 years researching what they ate, where they went, and then watching these bears die time and again and it was just getting worse, not better. And I told the, the gathered biologists at the conference, I want to change that. I want to do something about it. I can train almost any animal. I think I can teach bears. And so 22 years ago, I stood in front of scientists, my peers, and there were naysayers. There were definitely naysayers. But there were some folks that were pretty excited Dick Scheidler, who's been up in Prudhoe Bay and uh, helped to mentor Nils, developed bear dog, using bear dogs, den detection work. Um, John Hechtel. John Hechtel was a, on soft money for, I don't know, 20, 30 years. He was another long-term bear biologist. He got the first bear dog that I put out with somebody else. So interestingly, Alaska, you guys are part of my history. I'm back 22 years later. I told these guys, this is what I'm going to do. And you know what? We've done it. It's taken 22 years, but we've implemented it all over the world. In, and specifically, our teams in three countries, the US, Canada, and Japan. Almost all on grizzlies, except in Japan. And why? Because the money was there in the lower 48 because it was a threatened species. Why didn't we start up here? Because really, we were 20 years ahead of our time. I mean, there was no science of 
wildlife human conflict. The human dimension stuff, you know, that's been in the last 15 years. And so we start, I picked starting out in, in Montana where we had the, the contiguous grizzly bear populations from Canada to allow us to focus on bears that the managers were trying to um, bring out of threatened uh, designation. And I was lucky. I had abysmal undergrad grades, just so you know. <laughs> and it wasn't in all of the classes, but it was in the ones I wasn't interested in. And, but I had an advisor who believed in me and he gave me a chance to go to grad school. And I started grad school with the hammer over my head. You gotta get straight A's. Oh my God, I learned how to study. <laughs> and, and I went from there to transferring over to, that was at the Montana State University in Bozeman. And I went from there to the University of Montana and was taken in by one of the world's foremost bear researchers, Chuck Jonkel, and he had been told, this gentleman here. he had been told, do not take any more grad, unfunded grad students, no more, and he took me in, and he believed in what I wanted to do. I wanted to try to teach bears to go wild again and dovetail the approach with working with the publics to educate them. And make no mistake, just because you like to work on wildlife, you can't make headway in conflict work unless you're willing to work with the public. And that's really important. And a lot of people that want to work with Wind River don't make it because they want to work with the bears. A lot of them didn't realize how much time it takes to work with the dogs and then working with the public. Well, by the time you hit your 300th house of talk, knocking on a door, somebody opens it and you have to talk to them about the garbage all over their porch and the, the grizzly bear that's out there, you're, you're tired of working with the public. <laughs> and so in 1996, I founded the Wind River Bear Institute and over the past 22 years, we've done about 800, uh, we've worked on about 800 bear pushes a year. Our programs have been aimed to reduce property damage, reduce bear mortality, increase public safety, and use Carilion Wildlife Service dogs to do the work. It's, it pioneered, oh, what, what have our results been? Well, in a nutshell, I developed bear spray with my masters. The world didn't have it. That came from my masters. And you know, I wanted to go out and follow bears around with telemetry. Instead, I'm taking these one-way bears that are gonna be killed and trying to figure out, do flares work? Do boat horns work? Do mothballs work. What works to stop a charging bear? Why? Because the number one cause of bear mortality in the lower 48 is food conditioned bears coming into campgrounds. And, and that is what put them in threatened status. Not hunting, not, de you know, it was, and then second to that was uh, depredation on cattle down there, that's a big deal. So, um, so over time, the development of pepper spray, uh, the development of the idea you can teach bears through operant conditioning, which means you get the bear to make the right choices. It's not aversive conditioning. Don't think that when you hear people talking about aversive conditioning, we're the group that actually teaches bears to make the right choices versus hazing where you hit bears intermittently and all they need to do is learn to be sneakier. 
relocation of bears. It works sometimes, most of the time it doesn't work. So for us, I, we developed hard releases, turning bears loose right where they're causing problems. And you have to realize these managers that we never work unless the agency allows us to work with one of their people. So these managers are big enough to let us show them new techniques. And you have to come in acting like you respect how they've had to do business. And just working with these individuals has been really interesting because they have to do it by themselves. And suddenly you're trying to show them that if they turn the bear loose in the campground that they've been trying to catch that bear <laughs> and get it out of, he probably won't come back to that campground. That's pretty cool. So hard releases, the use of rubber bullets on grizzlies, nobody had ever done that till we did it. Nobody had ever done hard releases out of traps, hitting bears with bullets until we did it. This is a track record. We have made a difference, and I'm excited about it. And the times are right now to go forward. The times are right to have folks like you, if you want to do this kind of thing, teach wildlife. You have to teach people. Managers are open to it. Nobody wants to kill an animal. Why would they want to? But you know what? If that animal can't learn, it does have to die and because that's what would have happened anyway. So the final milestone, I think, and one that we're, we're working on still is to have people understand, managers, uh, property owners, that the right dogs can help you teach bears. And not every dog can do it. We need dogs that are going to say to that bear, you poor sucker, I'm on leash or I'd be eating you. The bear would read fear. These dogs are specially chosen by us out of our litters through a testing process. That's what I'm up here doing. Nils is our Curly and Bear Dog Program Manager and he's done the first satellite litter in Alaska, finally. And I will mention that the very first job I ever had with this whole program was in Soldatna with John Hechtel and we were getting black bear out of moose, the moose feeding stations after the, the big die off. And uh, so Alaska is a very special place for me. This is, it's just odd how I'm back here doing the first litter with the guy that will take our U.S. programs on after I retire, which I will never retire from training dogs. I don't have to. <laughs> but I am tired of talking to people about garbage and picking up garbage. I am a really good garbage picker upper, you know, and I'm tired of it. So, so um, I think with that, I'm just gonna, I, you know, what? Yeah, sure thing. I, I, I guess ask, has anyone here ever had to deploy bear spray or, or done it just to practice? Any chance? Raise hands, yeah. Do you know where the it's, specs came yeah. from for bear spray? Well, the specs are three feet wide and 20 feet long. And I found it worked with these caged bears that I, I was a grad student. I had my mother dressed in a garbage bag making the bears charge her with a thing. And then she'd go back to my truck and eat candy after each each one and I'd write up the data. Well, she's still alive. And, and uh, but bear spray, you know, it, it looked, it used, it came first in a little canister that the postman used. It was called Holt. And postman carried it and it had a pencil thin spray and that's how they turn nasty dogs around and I saw that it worked on the bears that I had in captivity and so that went into the newspapers and a Vietnam vet came up to me and said I'll put it in a canister for you what do you want 
and so I told him I want I want three feet wide so I don't have to aim it at their eyes and nose anymore because it works on the membranes of the nose and the eyes. So what does it do? It blinds the bear. He can't see the problem. He can't smell the problem. Railroad flares did not work. Uh, opening an umbrella didn't work. Boat horns didn't work. But this stuff worked. And so he put it in a canister. His name is Bill Pounds and marketed. I didn't, he, I didn't want, I mean, <laughs> now I wish I'd maybe ask for some sort of part in it, but I didn't want to spend my life marketing bear spray. I'm a, I'm a biologist and I, I didn't want to. I'm just thrilled that it's gone worldwide. I get all the free bear spray I want. That's <laughs> Counter salt is the brand. So it's three it's feet wide, yeah, counter salt, and, and that 20 feet is kind of where a bluff charge is going to stop. All of our shepherding, all of our teaching of bears is about putting the bear in, in his own situation based, and asking him to respond based on the way he has to live. So a bluff charge... Once he's inside there, he's committed. And it's about 20 feet. So that's how far pepper spray goes, 20 feet. That's kind of where it came from. Yeah, and uh, so kind of the <laughs> back up to your um, development of the spray, you were in these dumps having bears charge you. You were basically in a jail cell. Yeah. Right? Yeah, so you had a... a physical barrier between yourself and the, and the charging bear. Italian prisoner but, of war camp is where yeah. I kept the bears. <laughs> <laughs> I cried when I realized that's what I was going to be doing, not out there traipsing around, enjoying, <laughs> you know, telemetry and where the bears go and eat. <laughs> but, but it needed to be done. And I would, I would say that, you know, of all things, uh, all me methods or ways we have to, to deal with uh, aggressive encounter with the bear, um, bear spray is probably one of the largest um, contributions to the world of non-lethal and the most effective tool we have. And there's a couple reasons for that. Uh, one of which is that, um, you know, in that kind of a situation, as opposed to using a firearm or lethal force, you don't have to kill that bear. So, uh, you know, someone who's been involved in, in a nasty encounter with the bear that resulted in a bear having to be killed, uh, I can tell you that it's it's a sad situation. It's not, you know, you, you're immediately afraid for your own life, but afterward, uh, you know, remorseful for the fact that you had to kill this bear, and it very well may have been a bluff charge anyway, or a defensive encounter. So it's, um, you know, it's not to be taken lightly. Um, and it teaches the bear, you win. I mean, all of us yeah. think about what is the bear learning when you do something? Well, if it's hazing, he's learning to be sneakier. And that makes sense. It's like your dog getting into garbage. Well, every time you leave the house, he's going to come back and get into garbage. And this is about teaching the bear, and you have to be super consistent. And it's hard. You're out all night, all day, and you are getting that bear. Uh, you are working with that bear every time, or almost every time, he ha gets into what you're trying to fix and change. So Yeah, so that's right. It, it also provides that bear with, a, with an experience with humans that's negative, so it's uh, you know, helpful for keeping that bear on the landscape and teaching it how to behave around people. But uh, <clears throat> I would say even more so than that, um, you know, when you have something like bear spray, which is easy to carry, easy to use, you don't need to be a good shot or you know um, be able to use a firearm. Exactly. You can have this bear spray with you. Most people can use it, um, and it gives you the the courage to stand there and encounter like this and hold your ground and actually even. Or know. in a tent at night when you can't see, you're not wounding a bear. You're, I mean, you may hate what you do to yourself with that stuff, but <laughs> by the same token, that bear is leaving. And that is why, I mean, in the lower 48, the number one cause of human fatalities is food-conditioned bears coming into camps. So, and, and we should define, so we have two terms that were kind of thrown around here that I think should be defined, habituation and food conditioning. And these are both uh, states to describe 
a bear's behavior. And habituation is fairly common. Habituation is essentially the um, you know repeated neutral encounters with a bear. So if it's with humans, for example, this bear is spending a lot of time around people, becoming very used to being around people, and starting to basically ignore them. You could uh, use the analogy, for example, that you know I live in the woods in Fairbanks. I hear very little traffic noise. If you put me in Boston, I would hear the sirens. I would hear the traffic. I would hear th these city noises. Um, I, but I would not be habituated to them. But somebody who lives in Boston might be habituated to that those noises and not really notice them anymore. So a bear that spends a lot of time around people <coughs> can become habituated to them over time of having repeated neutral experiences with people. And uh, the other term that we're, we're using here is, is food conditioning. And that is, can be defined as uh, an association that a bear develops between food and people. And so that happens when there's garbage available to bears, or people are actively feeding bears themselves in some instances. And so that bear actually will start to develop a, an association between the two. And, you know, so for example, I might be somebody who's very comfortable around bears, and I'm throwing a bear a sandwich out of my truck because I want to take a photograph of it. Well, you know, that's all well and good for me, but, and that bear is learning something very dangerous because the next person that they encounter, they might think, well, people are, are pretty cool. They have sandwiches. And, uh, or be on the highway more. Be on the okay. highway, so. spending time on the highway and hit by a car. Yeah. So you have to figure out how do you talk to the photographers that make their living off of wildlife and bear pictures. <laughs> and this whole shepherding is not just meant for bears. It we focused on bears, but we have done a few cougar now. We've done a lot of bighorn sheep, very effectively for roadside work. Um, moose. Yep. So this, the idea is to that you can teach wildlife just like you can train a dog, but you have to be consistent or they learn the wrong things. So some of, so we've developed a, a uh, three profiles of what aggression levels are worth working with, what um, conflict levels are worth working in. For instance, a bear that is willing to come in at night versus a bear coming in in the day versus a bear that is willing to commit body parts into human stuff like getting in a truck versus up on a deck versus just the edge of your cabin and eating bird feed, that's a big difference. Finally, bears that are willing to go into three and then four-sided stuff. Livestock killing bears, we can't fix that right now. Not to say it's not possible, but that's a whole nother ball of wax. They've got a whole nother drive going. All of it is food, but that prey drive is different. And to try to fix chicken killers, cow killers, that's different. That's a big food reward and it's a big adrenaline rush. And, and most of them are, I mean, they're so spread out that how do you, you know, there the public needs to be educated. You don't have chickens and chicken feed available to bears because they come in almost always for the chicken feed. So again, it's thinking about how does a bear think. That's the beauty of the way we do the work. And when I say, how does that bear think, he comes in because he smells the grain, he busts into the chicken coop, he's eating this huge sack of grain, which is like massive food reward. And these chickens are fluttering around, and he kills one. Oh, now we've got a chicken killer. And that continues. That doesn't change. That's almost always how they start. And then you hear, you get the call, and they say, well, he was in my chicken coop eating grain for a couple nights, and now he's killing my chickens. And you're like, Jesus, why didn't you call when he was just eating your grain? Well, you know, that's, so if, What's really probably so exciting about this is 
thinking like a bear, thinking about how bears think, offering conditioning to define the term in a very general way is you, the bear does something and our response is to do something. And then based on how that bear responds, if he leaves, we back off. If he decides to dilly-dally, well, we're hitting him with rubber bullets. If we can't get close enough for rubber bullets, we're lobbing cracker shell rounds in behind him. As soon as he goes into cover, we stop everything, we get in the truck and we leave, or we walk out of there. So the bear learns a really cool thing. The bear learns if I, number one, the bear learns it can leave. And you're talking most of the work that we've done is grizzly bears with cubs. So, A, we get to have the sow teaching the cubs how to respond, but B, that bear wants those cubs out of there. People think that that would be very hard. Well, it is hard if you ask the bear to do something it can't do because it's trying to get its cubs out too. So you have to think, how's that bear thinking? I've got to get my cubs out. You teach the bear first, you can always leave then you make harder and harder uh, um, repercussions for the wrong choices. Does that make sense? And the beautiful thing is that we've done about 800 actions for 22 years worldwide with the dogs that we've placed in different places and uh, we've never had one injury. For 22 years, about 800 actions, not one injury to a dog, not one, not one to a person, not one to a bear.